Welcome to the final session of the CERC uh, Migration Annual Conference. Um, today, uh, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Oreva Olakpe, and I'm a researcher at CERC, and I'm very happy to be chairing this session with my colleague, Dr. Ashika. Um, we're very excited to do this, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussions we're going to have. Um, today, we uh, focusing on decentering knowledge of migration narratives with a focus on East and West Africa. Um, migration is um, something that is very intrinsic to Africans' way of life. Um, for many centuries before colon colonialism happened, our ancestors moved um, around a lot. Um, even like, I, I, and, and because of that migration is the reason why scientifically Africans are the most diverse group of people in the world. Um, because of the, um, uh, uh, the centering of certain external um, agendas um, contemporarily, we have a, 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 a situation where African migration is, constructed to be something that is negative, something that must be circumscribed, prevented. Um, and African migrants are very dehumanized in the experience of migration. And um, it's something that the experience is um, uh, in, in journeys to other parts of the world. But now, even within the continent, that negative narrative is affecting how people within different regions are experiencing uh, migration. Um, and also regrettably, uh, because of uh, the issue of funding coming from the global north, you have a significant amount of research that um, tends to promote that narrative and also focus on only certain types of migration. And um, because of the, this, it's, it's the reason why it's very important for us to transcend the limitations of those dominant narratives so that we can have a more, more holistic understanding of um, migration in Africa and the experiences of African migrants. By expanding our focus, we can grasp the underlying dynamics, motivations, and aspirations that drive uh, migration within these regional contexts. Um, and uh, we aim to use this session to broaden our understanding and challenge those um, dominant perspectives from institutions like the EU, for example, that have overshadowed the richness and the complexity of regional migration um, on the continent. Um, I would like to use this uh, moment to express my sincere gratitude to the speakers today for um, not only coming here from um, very distant um, places, um, also giving their time to share their very fantastic research with us um, about the research, uh, the realities on the continent. Their unique expertise will shed light uh, on this very important subject matter. It's, it's a very important issue to me because because of not only um, my experiences as someone who has migrated to different parts of the world, but also because of the importance of um, changing the perception of uh, African migrants um, globally. Um, so I will now introduce the speaker, uh, uh, the speakers. The first speaker is Melissa Moulton from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And she will be speaking about migration narratives and the ability to move in Ghana. Um, and uh, the other speaker that will come after her is Mary Butema Setrana from the University of Ghana. And she will be unpacking the narratives of migration and gender in the West African region. And um, Amanda Bisong from the European Center for Development Policy Management will be speaking about narratives on freedom of movement in um, the West African region. And finally, Gramachu Aduna from Addis Ababa University will be speaking about regional migration narratives in East Africa. Um, uh, uh, Mansi here will be showing you like the time you have left. Um, I think there's plenty of time. And yeah, 
I'm very excited to welcome Melissa to share her research. Um, thank you to the chair for the introduction. Uh, thank you also to Anna for organizing this, this very fascinating conference so far. There's been many rich conversations here uh, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. Um, so I'll be talking today, um, so um, my presentation draws on uh, two distinct research projects. Uh, so firstly, of course, my own. Um, but also that of my co-author, co Dr. Michael Bonpong, formerly with the Open University, uh, now with Childline International. Uh, and I'll be talking about migration narratives um, by both domestic actors, but also external actors in, uh, in Ghana. Um, yeah, so this is the, um, the layout of my presentation. Uh, and apologies also because I started to lose my voice this morning, uh, which is really inconvenient timing, but hopefully um, I can make myself understood nonetheless. Um, so Ghana is a um, so present day migration context in Ghana. Uh, it's a significant country of emigration. Um, and um, so this picked up significantly in the 70s and 80s during uh, economic downturn. Um, mostly this consists of migration in the region, uh, so in the ECOWAS region. Um, I think a recent estimate was that about 70% of uh, Ghanaian um, emigration occurs within, within the West African region. Um, but also beyond that, to OECD countries, and particularly the UK and the US, but, but it's important to remember that's a smaller phenomenon than um, migration that happens within the West African region. Um, it's also a country of immigration, so many, uh, many migrants uh, come to Ghana for education, for employment opportunities, um, and uh, also that uh, Ghana has a large di diaspora community <clears throat> um, who often retain strong links to, um, to their home country. Um, it's a country who, whose economy benefits a lot from uh, migrant remittances. It's been developing um, national migration policy frameworks in the last decades, including a um, uh, diaspora engagement policy. Um, but also in the wider context, um, there's uh, regional migration agendas that it is um, party to. So the ECOWAS Free Movement Protocol of 1979 in particular. Um, and it's also subject to the EU's externalization agenda. Um, as many, many other countries uh, in the West African region are as well. And what this, um, what this means is that, um, so the EU's agenda increasingly tries to prevent migration directly in countries of origin. Um, so just to give a quick overview of how narratives have changed over time. So there's been, um, so narratives on migration and development have changed. There's been less emphasis on the potential of migration and transnationalism to contribute to development. Um, there's been more emphasis, and this was mentioned also yesterday, on migration deterrence and preempting departures. And what that looks like often is that um, interventions now very much target would-be migrants, potential migrants, and you can see that in where um, projects interventions take place as well in um, communities of uh, prominent migrant departure. Um, and there's also been more emphasis on the so-called root causes of migration and addressing those. So um, looking at how to promote economic opportunities and developments, um, but also uh, this is also quite often a negative framing of migration, um, so addressing the root causes uh, in the sense that migration is a bad thing that should be um, prevented. Um, so I'll be looking at three aspects <clears throat> of um, migration narratives that, and how, the, how these play out in Ghana. Um, I'll be looking at um, two aspects uh, of narratives that are often <clears throat> um, um, advocated by external actors. So firstly, a sedentary bias and a neoliberal bias. And then I'll also be looking at how um, domestic state actors promote a economic gains lens in, uh, in domestic state policy. Um, so just quickly also, um, the research, um, the analysis draws on documentary research, secondary literature, um, semi-structured interviews mainly, but also other participatory methods. Um, interviews were conducted in uh, between 2016 and 2018, um, primarily in, uh, in Ghana, so in Accra, in the Ashanti region, um, but also with uh, migrant um, uh, diaspora communities in London and New York. 
And without much further ado, I'll move on to um, our findings. Um, so firstly, looking at um, awareness raising campaigns as a tool of uh, used by external actors uh, to dissuade would-be migrants uh, directly in Ghanaian communities. Um, and um, these are very much used in Ghana um, by the EU, by EU member states, other external actors. Um, what they have in common is that they um, emphasize the poor conditions uh, experienced in Europe as an irregular migrant. Um, and this is um, clear from the citation that I've included uh, from one of my interviewees, that um, someone from the EU delegation to Ghana. Um, and she says, um, there are risks that they take in crossing the desert. Uh, they can't work because, uh, when they arrive in Europe because they don't have papers. So there's very much uh, emphasizing um, that you won't have a, you won't have good conditions. Um, there won't be good opportunities for you when you arrive in Europe. Um, they also emphasize the dangers of the <clears throat> of the migration route. Um, what I found very striking was. Um, um, that um, so these awareness raising campaigns, they very much use local voices to lend cred credibility to these campaigns. So um, they recruit um, quite often failed migrants, uh, returnees um, in these campaigns, um, in, in this campaigning, and quite often the traumatic experiences of these of these uh, returnees um to convince other potential migrants not to um to pursue this um so so that was uh, very striking um and i think also what this uh, often looks like is um um uh so these local voices are also used for creating warning messages on national television um to produce videos that are broadcast on um, for example, on buses um, along prominent migration routes in Ghana, such as um, the Northern Migration Route. Um, and the idea really is to give these externally derived narratives a local dimension and to, um, and to make them perhaps more accepted by, by local audiences. Um, the next aspects of um, external uh, narratives that are um, I'll look at is um, the so-called migration alternatives. Um, so in presenting um, very specific, uh, so ex external actors very, prof uh, very often present very specific um, prescriptive migration alternatives. And this is very often uh, entrepreneurship alternative, um, sorry, entrepreneurship um, opportunities, um, vocational training um, solutions. Um, and the key characteristics of these interventions are often that they target youths and, as, again, aspiring migrants. Um, they very much focus on business formation. Um, they place emphasis on personal endeavor and private sector solutions, overcoming local development challenges. And this is very um, emblematic of neoliberal political ideology. Um, essentially, migrants have to help themselves um, and they are responsible for their own um, their own opportunities. Um, so what, what is really striking again is this, there's a strong optimism on the potential of entrepreneurship as a migration aspiration fix. Um, but again, what I found to be missing from these kind of narratives is that actually also um, entrepreneurship carries an element of risk. Um, and this is never, um, never really communicated in these narratives. Um, they're presented as risk-free, uh, which of course isn't the case either. Um, and then switching to um, domestic state actors. So the Ghanaian um, government um, has, um, similarly to other African countries, pursued a very active policy of diaspora engagement. Um, but what that policy looks like is um, that it's very much skewed in favor of a um, economic gains perspective. Um, so um, this comprises um, many state-led top-down narratives that seek primarily to, uh, primarily to derive economic gains from diaspora and from migrants. Um, they're uh, skewed in favor of, for example, attracting skills and resources um, of highly skilled migrants, encouraging the return of highly skilled migrants, but not necessarily um, uh, migrants of more diverse skill sets. 
um, in comparison also um, something that potential returnees often raise is the portability of social security. Um, and this is something that the Ghanaian government hasn't really pursued with uh, other host states, uh, other governments. Um, so again, it's not a priority for them. Um, and also as a major country of immigration, um, Ghana has also um, quite often not uh, done enough to extend um, the social protection and rights of migrants in Ghana and as a major country of immigration, that's also um, perhaps um, a bit of an oversight. Um, so looking then at how do these narratives compare with um, young Ghanaians' aspirations and what do we see shaping youth aspirations in Ghana? Um, so firstly, of course, globalization. Um, so Ghanaian youths are connected uh, with global flows of ideas, of course. Um, they are consumers of global goods, uh, whether that's mobile phones or uh, clothes. Um, they receive representations of other places through the media, through their relatives abroad, um, and, and through, uh, of course, through technology. Um, so uh, that certainly shapes aspirations. Um, secondly, there's, um, there's the failure of the promise of education and modern modernity in Ghana. So uh, there's a rising middle class, there's um, an increasing number of um, young graduates, um, young people with a bachelor's degree, um, but they're finding that actually they aspire to jobs and lifestyles that match their qualifications, and those are simply those oppor opportunities are simply not there for them in Ghana. Um, and so um, that's also um, a major issue. Um, um, and so finally also, um, there's this day-to-day -day city uh, realities of life. And um, so if we consider that career options, mainly in the big city, are mainly in the big cities, so in Accra, in Kumasi, um, but city conditions can be quite poor in these places. Um, so rapid urbanization has occurred without necessarily corresponding um, urban planning strategies. Um, and there's, for example, high housing costs. And um, so the day-to-day -day reality, the grind of city life um, is also perhaps fueling migration aspirations amongst young Ghanaians. So to come to, um, and con yeah, to conclusion, um, well, yes, um, so, um, so to look firstly at narratives of dissuasion. Um, so I find that uh, insofar that there is a logic of migration in Ghanaian communities, um, it's difficult to reconcile this with um, um, the politics of control. Um, and what we see is that there's, um, so there is certainly an ongoing culture of migration. Um, that many of these narratives contend with youth, youth aspirations in Ghana. Um, so that firstly, um, also the narratives of dissuasion, um, they often obscure the EU's role in rendering migration journeys risky. Um, so um, essentially the EU's um, method of, um, um, of, of um, well, promoting a sedentary bias in its narratives, um, also depoliticizes the fact that EU policies are responsible for making the migration uh, routes riskier, and that is often obscured by these narratives. Um, what other researchers are looking into now is that um, um, the sedentary um, bias um, and the narratives of dissuasion, they also undermine regional integration agendas. And, um, and the free movement protocol in, in the region. Um, so this, uh, this again, is um, um, something that uh, contends, of course, uh, with, um, yeah, um, there's contending narratives already in the region uh, that contend with the EU dissuasion narratives. Uh, and then finally, also the economic gains lens um, promoted by domestic state actors. Um, so, um, so while that's, um, 
while that looks very much primarily at um, di diaspora engagement policies, um, what we're seeing is that extending um, other parts of a more coherent migration policy in Ghana um, is being taken up more by civil society actors. So it's more nonprofit organizations in Ghana that are um, advocating for extending migrants' rights in the country, um, but that this is very much not um, being taken up as it should be at the level of um, <clears throat> of states, uh, state actors. So, um, yeah, I will conclude there. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Melissa, for such an insightful presentation, uh, particularly um, uh, the point you are raising about the role of youth aspirations in shaping um, migration governance in the region. Um, I will now leave the floor to Mary for her presentation. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for inviting me, Anna. And thank you for the entire team for organizing this and inviting me from Ghana. All right, so um, two things influenced the writing of this paper. Last year, I wrote a paper with a colleague on the gender dynamics in West Africa. And so when I was invited, I thought about my own experience working with different governments, trying to develop, help them facilitate migration policies plus what I did last year on trying to assess the dynamics of gendered migration. And so um, I put things together and then try to look at some narratives and see if we can unpack some of these narratives and what are the dominant narratives, what are the counter narratives, what can we talk about and how are they reflected in our policies or the policies I have worked with so far. And so it's unpacked narratives on migration governance and gender in West Africa. And maybe to also say that, um, which will come up in my last presentation, I remember one of the meetings I was called to talk about gender. You know, we had, we had finished the labor migration policy for Ghana. So I was sitting somewhere quietly. I was called, we need a gender expert to try to see how we can fit gender into the finished labor policy. And then while we were having the meeting, and this is for the gender ministry. So one guy said, so where were we when they were doing this policy? And now we are struggling to fit in gender. And we have to take each thematic area to try to see what is gender about it. And so we always see gender as afterthoughts. And so putting all these pieces together, they have informed what I'm trying to present this morning. But before I do that, let me try to give you an overview. So international migration has remained fairly constant, about 3.5%. And then when we talk about the percentage of women internationally, it's 48% compared to the men. And then this has increased over the period. So it used to be 47.5. And then in 2020, the last time I was looking at the data, it was 48%. And so over a period of 20 years, there has been an estimated 0.4% increase in female international migration. And so a good number of single and married women migrate independently within the West African and even other places. Yet, when you come to the West African context, not much has been done to narrate the positive impact or narration around the increasing independent migration of these women have not been spoken about. And so in this presentation, I want to look at the discourses surrounding the linkages between migration governance and gender for a better understanding of the competing and counter narratives framing the debate and policy, and also look at actors of such narratives and the effects the narratives have in shaping migration governance. Specifically, I'll be looking at policies in this regard. And I think I have already said the basis of um, the data. And so let's look at some gender dynamics in West Africa. Um, so within the West Africa, this is um, the trend. And so from 1960, the last time I had the data was 2019. Um, so there has been increasing shell females, as you can see, when you compare it to Africa. And so there is, at least in some of the years, Af West Africa was higher. And this is 
we attribute, I mean, some of the studies we've done also attribute it to the increasing number of skilled and independent women migrating to fulfill their own dreams. And I think that has been said already by my colleague that most of the policies are geared towards skills. And so, yes, at least we, we are also excited that women are not just accompanying their husbands and or fathers, but they are also making decisions on their own. And so it also falls in line with the global feminization of migration. And so when you look at the various countries also, you see, yes, there is male dominance, so male, males are more, but at least see the increasing trend of women joining the migration um, journey. And so I try to look at some conceptual issues, not to go deep into it, but what is informing these narratives? So the media and advocacy organizations play a, crit a critical role in shaping migration narratives and using them to explore social issues and also offer solutions. And other factors such as politics interests are also significant in determining the political setting, the actors, the networks are also important in facilitating the exchange of these ideas. Micro narratives, we can talk about migrants themselves and the communities, either the host or home communities, they also form part in, in shaping these narratives that we find. And so the narratives on gender migration, apart from the factors that I have outlined, there is also a cultural characteristics or instinct also in there. And so the cultural dimension, which we often don't talk about, also helps to institutionalize or what I say, garnish, garnish the conversation and makes them natural, normal. That is how it is, so we need to deal with it. And so here, people's culture is of importance as they interact to determine what is the norm and what is not depending on the power dynamics. And so here I draw my ideas from the layers of the struggles of migrant women due to hegemonic migration narratives in the West African sub-region. And so here such narratives have been instituted by migration and border man mig management policies in the sub-region. So he, um, from here, I look at key narratives on gender migration in the West African context. So the first one I come across is migrant men as breadwinners and movers. And so even when theoretically you look at the, um, the theories, migration theories, it says women don't move too far, short distances. And so garnish or maybe um, also um, if you are the culture bits, then it means that an important part of the literature of West African migration and and it's focused on gender. See males as social, males see migration as social becoming and migration as a pathway of improvement. And so within several cultural contexts, you need to even migrate as a man to become an adult. For you to become a chief, you need to migrate. And so even young children at some point are sent off to gain some experience from somewhere. And so adulthood is generally perceived as desirable in West Africa with adult masculinity being seen as related to strong family va values and ready for marriage and ready to provide for your family. And so there are some examples from West Africa in from the Francophones. And it says it's a commonly used term for prim primarily male youth. So they call it, um, sorry about my French, I, I think I left it home, but Ale en Aventure. It's a commonly used term for primarily male youth migration to unknown places where the migrant does not have pre existing strong social networks. And that is how you mature into adulthood as a man. So here, yes, that's the cultural part compared with the narratives we are having. But what are the counter narratives? Migrant women as independent migration decision makers and movers, and not just following their husbands as the literature makes it look like. So we often overlook the fact that African women have been migrating independently for decades, even um, prior to the 1980s, when we started using the term feminization of migration in the West African context, aspiring to change their own lives and their future. And so the social becoming and pathway to a better future pertains to women as well. 
And there is a counter narrative from a period of low participation of women to an increasing participation of women. And so one of the, I, I had some interviews. One of the interviews said, no one should assume I have been trafficked or smuggled. So this is one of the women I spoke to No, I went in search of greener pasture just as my brothers and male friends do. I couldn't achieve my migration dream as planned, but it is not because I am a woman. So I am being treated as someone who didn't have the willpower to make a choice when I was ready to migrate. I planned and I moved. No one influenced me. And so from that idea, I mean, we changed the narrative. No matter the experiences, she took the decision herself. The second one is female migrants as vulnerable and victims of migration. So when you look into the policies, you look into the media narratives, you look into the discussions in classes, migrant women are seen as vulnerable victims. They, they don't have the strength to do it. So in the name of protecting migrant women, the media reports and policy discourses find ways of describing and protecting the perceived vulnerable migrant woman. Such narratives have resulted in tragic emergency immigration restrictions, mainly targeted at women. And such um, studies have also demonstrated that although yes, we are seeing that our women as vulnerable, there are also men who are equally vulnerable, especially in the trafficking um, cases where, where men are also trafficked into different things. Some are trafficked for sex organs, among others. And so this is media reports from Kenya. Nigeria was also the same where you find Ghana bans recruitment of workers to Gulf countries because it became a time around the, I think 2017 before the COVID era and during the COVID, there was this extensive abuse of women in the Gulf states. And instead of looking for strategies, governments just ban, they don't care, stop going. You, are, you don't know your rights, we are helping you. So stop, don't move. But women found different ways of migrating. So instead of going through Ghana, now they go to Togo and then off they go. They find different ways. So Kenya also did the same. Government official recommends on recruitment of, ban on recruitment of workers to Saudi Arabia. And Amanda also has a paper during the COVID where the government just banned them. And so then once it's about women, they are vulnerable. So let's, let's tell them to stay home. But what are the other options? So I spoke to some migrant associations who do cross-border trading. And one of them said, the, woman, the women in my organization have benefited a lot from migration. They are traders. Some move to Togo, Burkina Faso, China, and many other places to buy goods. They bring them to Ghana to sell. As an organization of migrant women, we can testify that our families and friends have benefited from our movement and trading activities in other parts of the world. We give money to Togo, London, and US. You know we go with cash. We transact business, and it's money. During the COVID, when our husbands could not work, we, the women, managed to still link up with our partners. We supported our homes and our husbands. And this is true. A lot of women lost their jobs during the COVID, but the women were still working to support. So women migrants have been empowered, which is the other narrative that we don't hear. And they've been empowered. They have challenged the narratives that we always hear as the men being the breadwinner. And so West African women are migrating to educate themselves, find care work elsewhere, and also find better positions. So the increasing demand of services in care and domestic work also opens an opportunity. Yeah, so instead of banning, maybe we should look for better ways of ensuring that the, their rights are protected. This also happens in local in internal migration. So in Ghana, we have headquarters. And once it was COVID and they felt people were being, they just said, no, everybody pack your things, move out, without thinking about how to protect these migrants or give them opportunity to decide for themselves. So the other dominant narrative is women migration as a tool for breakdown of traditional family systems compared to men. And this one, I, I have my own experience where I sat in a car in Kenya and the driver said, where are you coming from Malawi? Where are you going to Kenya? And from here, where are you going to UK? So which man gave you the license to move like that? That was the question to me. And so here, you, you as a woman, it's seen as once you move, okay, the house is broken. So <laughs> nothing will move on. And so this is one of the quotes from one of the gender ministries. When children 
when children are delinquents, when the independent woman, migrant wife is blamed for not staying at home. No, when children are delinquent, the independent migrant wife is blamed for not staying at home. When the migrant woman crosses international border to educate herself or find jobs, she is described as uncaring and prostitute. Yet the husband, the uncle, the son who is migrant receives no such labeling because migration is seen as a man rightful obligation. Get negative perceptions and deep seated patriarchal ideas in the culture of people. And so these are some of the stories that. Um, support that we use to explain some of the narratives we see. So female migration has been cited as a major contributing factor to the breakdown of traditional family systems across many cultures in West Africa. And as more women leave their homes in search of better opportunities, either their own countries or abroad, they often leave behind family members who depend on their presence for emotional and social stability. That is why they will describe the massage. So in certain places of origin, they left behind men enforce their patriarchal rights by handing over the productive work to another woman. And most of the studies we have seen um, have shown that. And then rigid traditional expectations between husbands and wives at destination has also created tension leading to domestic violence. And here's some of my own works where I, um, where the, one of the returnees advised me to study migration and divorce among returnees because they said their wives could not cope with the patriarchal norms when they come back. And so these are some of the issues. So effective balancing life, which is a counter narrative. So women are mothering transnationally. They are forced to keep up with their jobs even while they are away, checking on the children, paying fees, sending others around. And these are things that we don't usually talk about. So quickly, let me look at the policies. So I looked at the ECOWAS protocol. And so yes, we have this nice um, AU framework that has migration and gender. And so in order to take the boxes, Almost all the countries who have worked for Sierra Leone, Zambia, Ghana, we have a section called migration, which is a key component. Without it, the policy will not pass. But to what extent are these things being implemented and how do they even work? And so, yes, we agree. ECOWAS protocol has enhanced movement in West Africa. It has liberated a lot of things for us. But um, how far is it? And so, the good thing is that ECOWAS is one of the few um, frameworks, the protocols is one of the few that has something on gender. And so it has, um, it, within the, the common approach policy on free movement, it has a specific se section on gender and migration. I mean, following the AU um, requirements. And so in that, the focus is on interest of paying attention, attention to special needs and interests of migrant women to improve decision-making and to reduce inequalities in migration processes. So all these are geared towards women. And if you listen to the narratives I gave, they are addressing the narratives that are already existing. And so let's target the women. And then when you move to, they have gender, ECOWAS gender and migration framework and plan of action. Again, here, there are key, five key areas. And they include areas including trading along the borders, borders of member states, and most of them are women, trafficking of persons, conflict induced displacement, tourism, sexual tourism, domestic workers. These emphasize or endorse the existing narrative that we see. And I think I've spoken about the fact that different countries are trying to have these thematic areas, but to what extent are they reflected in reality? But there are still challenges in even the attempts they are making. Certain obsolete practices in member countries continue to undermine the agency of female migrants. And so yes, ECOWAS says this, but in the country it doesn't work. An example is nations who require women to obtain permission from husbands or fathers to receive travel documents such as passports. In such nations, women are not allowed to travel with children without husband's or father's permission. This limits the right of women to migrate freely since travel documents are essential requirements for legal cross-border migration. 
and women crossing borders for training activities still face exploitation. They pay extra fees. Sometimes they are raped. Sometimes they are abused. And these are things that are embedded in national policies, which contradicts the ECOWAS protocol. So here to think about reflections, not as if I have solution to it. These are, that's my last slide. So one of the directors I spoke to in the ECOWAS region working on gender said, people should not gather to make policies and suddenly realize that there is a need for a woman. So they try to invite a few gender experts on migration, a few gender experts and migrant women to add and stay to address the gender problems. No, this is not what we want. We want to have a voice. We want to equally be represented to make suggestions as to what works best in the interest of both men and women. So, well, we need to change the narrative, but then there is a need for political will. There is the need for funding. They need, governments need to fund the process so that they can own and help it address the issues. And again, the media need to be engaged. I'm at fault because in all the core teams I'm on, there's no media team. And so we need to engage the media so that they can help us correct some of these narratives. And so I put this symbol there, it's an African symbol. It says um, the, Siamese, the Siamese crocodiles, but it's inclusiveness and no discrimination. And that inclusiveness includes everything. All that we have said, not only women, women, men, and everything that we need to make a better migration policy. Maybe sometimes I think of having a feminist migration policy, but how would it look like? And will it solve our problem? I don't know. Thank you. Thanks so much for such an um, important presentation about a, a very um, uh, ignored issue, uh, especially on um, taking the framing beyond vulnerability and victimhood for uh, female migrants. We will now leave the floor to Amanda. Um, I think Mary is a hard act to follow. She's a very passionate speaker <laughs> and a really good public speaker also. Um, my research is on um, analyzing the free movement of persons in West Africa. Um, it started uh, as a result of some conversations I was having um, with my supervisor uh, on free movement in West Africa. And uh, the discussions uh, also in the, in the EU around uh, free movement as uh, I think we saw a few articles where we saw uh, where, where they said, well, this free movement is, is imitating the Schengen um, area and uh, trying to implement Schengen-like policies in West Africa. And I was kind of upset because the discussions around free movement in West Africa predate the Schengen area. Um, the discussions around free movement in West Africa are linked to other um, issues that are not discussed currently. And so I started uh, searching around um, what, what really motivated um, the discussions on free movement in West Africa, how did this evolve over time and uh, dabbled a little bit into TWIL, which is a third world approaches to international law. Uh, looked at that a little bit, tried to see um, how uh, third world approaches helps to reshape or reframe the discussions around international law uh, concepts, also including um, international migration law. And then, yeah, I finally ended up with uh, this sort of frame that looks at uh, some of the prevalent narratives on free movement of persons in West Africa, looking at the degree of mobility and a uh, list of uh, different narratives um, that, that I, uh, uh, different sources of, of narratives that I, I looked at. Um, I looked at a lot of academic sources, uh, looked at the practices of courts in, in the region, um, looked at 
uh, regional policies, uh, policies of uh, uh, migration policies of six West African states, including some written by Mary, um, writings of uh, founding fathers, uh, academic sources, uh, looking at AU policies, and also observed um, practices. So this is a summary of a lot of work that I've been doing on, on, uh, on free movement of, of persons in West Africa. And what, what I'm trying to do with this paper is to question the current narratives around uh, free movement, um, looking at whether they reflect uh, truly what, the, what some of the underlying uh, uh, narratives, underlying uh, um, norms around movement of people and mobility in, in West Africa, wh whether these are reflected in the current narratives, looking also at how the narratives have changed um, over time. And uh, of course, I will uh, pay a lot of emphasis to the um, external narratives and how these are shaping um, the development of um, what I call illiberal uh, uh, migration narratives in the region. Okay, so looking at, uh, at my research, I think the findings I, I, I came up with, uh, not, not as intense or as amazing as I hoped, but the first one is that free movement is not, is not as simple as people try to make it seem. When we look at the region and we, in West Africa, the 15 countries, we know that uh, based on the regional economic community, um, there's a, the ECOWAS protocol that, that Mary mentioned on, on free movement, which kind of solidifies uh, the whole discussions around this, but it's not as simple as that. There are also other complex issues. There are interests of member states, there are interests of local communities, um, there are interests of different stakeholders that need to be taken into consideration when discussing um, issues around free movement. Um, the several narratives I've listed here, six of them, it's not like any is right or wrong, it's just that these are the narratives that exist when we're looking at um, free movement of persons in West Africa. So what should we do now? We know, and this is by no means uh, uh, conclusive, so I think if other people look at the data, they might come up with different narratives, but what do we do now that we know, we're aware that these narratives exist? I think it's, it's, it's necessary for us to understand that these narratives are there, they exist, and so they, they should define whatever policy solutions or, or whatever interventions we want to uh, come up with. These narratives are not uh, fixed, they change over time, which is another thing I found out, and they interact with each other, and their influences um, uh, vary. Uh, among themselves. So maybe we start with the first one, uh, free movement uh, in, in West Africa before and as a response to uh, colonialism. Sometimes when we talk about, uh, and I think uh, Oreva also um, said a, a bit about that in her introduction, sometimes when we talk about uh, uh, mobility of persons, we, we tend to adopt the, the mindset that uh, humans are sedentary, and so mobility is not the norm. But in reviewing uh, uh, some of the historic academic sources in, in, in West Africa, most of these academics approached mobility as the norm, so to say. We were mobile societies, uh, prehistoric, uh, uh, pre-colonial um, uh, West African societies, were mobile as a result of agriculture, as a result of trade, um, as a result of, of conflict. There were several reasons why um, societies moved or people uh, uh, moved um, in, in West Africa. And this, this was the norm uh, uh, based also on, on cultures of certain communities. And so then uh, it, it evolved from the pre-colonial to the uh, to the interaction with, uh, with colonialism where movement was now structured in a different way within uh, uh, certain, certain borders or certain spaces. And 
movement there also evolved as a response to colonialism. So you had uh, communities where people would, border communities where people would move from one side of the border, from the French speaking side of the border to the English speaking side of the border to evade taxes uh, and move back after the tax officials uh, were, were gone. And so people moved also uh, uh, in order to avoid forced conscriptions as a response uh, uh, to, to colonialism. But within that colonial period also, there were people who, uh, professional elites who moved, uh, who were, who were uh, their movement was, was enabled as being part of a civil service. So either the French civil service or the British civil service, and they were able to move within the region, also move to, uh, also move to um, uh, the, the colonies and, and come back uh, um, afterwards. So I think th these are aspects of mobility that we really don't hear about um, in, in the discussions. So the second aspect is free movement as a fundamental right. And here I look at the practices of um, national courts, uh, sorry, of regional courts, uh, and also of civil societies where you, I mean, in, in some very, uh, in some civil society settings, you really hear the civil society organizations say it is our right to move as Africans, we have the right to move. And so adopting this sedentary uh, uh, view of mobility or of people moving over the society is, is really in, in stark contrast to um, people seeing uh, uh, mobility as an inherent right that they have as, as humans. Uh, and we've seen this also in, in the practice of regional courts where there are several cases uh, that have been uh, either before the African Court on Human and Persons Rights or before the ECOWAS Court of Justice as it relates to uh, mobility of people where the rights of people, first of all, the rights of migrants are first protected before looking at uh, the, the um, obligation of the states to protect its borders and things like that. So it's first of all the right of the of the of the of the of the migrant or the right of the person moving, and also uh, the fact that there is this uh, free movement protocol in place which enables people to move. Then afterwards, looking at the obligations of the states in respecting uh, that right to move. Another uh, 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 fundamental uh, narrative uh, around uh, free movement is the linkages to economic development through regional integration. So here it has to do with the formation um, of the of, of ECOWAS, which is the economic community of West African states. And looking there, um, the underlying narrative was to strengthen um, West African states in, in their um, economic development, their post-colonial development as a response to uh, the existing structures, existing power structures and existing uh, power dynamics. And looking at the founding documents of, of ECOWAS, you would also see that a very key uh, thread that ran through these documents was the focus on, on, uh, on, on free movement um, of persons as a strong uh, part of regional economic development. This is also linked to uh, free movement in the context of, of, of the continental discussions at the AU and also Pan-Africanism, which played a strong role in, in, in the discussions on this. Um, on the other hand, what we see is also um, an increase in uh, the nationalist views on free movement. So here, free movement is framed in terms of a threat to national security or uh, free movement and identity linked to identity politics and xenophobia. Uh, uh, one of the, I think the, the, the one of the initial uh, discussions on this uh, uh, or one of the initial events around this had to do with the, the Ghana Moscow um, discussions uh, when several Ghanaians were evicted from Nigeria. Several uh, Nigerians were also evicted Evicted from from Ghana in in the in the 1970s, and I think we still see trends around uh, these uh, when we when we look at uh, the several expulsions that that are still ongoing um, in 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 the region, uh, be it from from Mali, uh, uh, Burkina Bay being expelled from Mali, or uh, people being expelled from Cote d'Ivoire also. Um, but free movement in in is now being uh, framed as a, as a threat to national security, also with the discussions around terror, increasing terrorism in the region, and we see the 
links also to identity politics and xenophobia, um, especially when it's around uh, uh, election periods in the region. Um, so you, you have a situation where there are several people that live on one side of the border, vote on the other side of the border, and these are issues uh, uh, that come up. And political elites are always very, um, very, uh, they always point out these issues to say, well, we have uh, foreigners who are coming to vote in our country, they don't live here. But when you understand the fluidity of movements between the both sides of the border, it's understandable that someone who lives and works in one country, um, but uh, is, is, is a national of another country would probably have the right to vote on both sides of, of the border. Another thing that we're seeing increasingly is the external uh, European narratives and their influence on free movement in West Africa. Uh, and from this research, one of the main points I came up with was that um, the, the influence, the external influence um, of European narratives on free movement in West Africa is being is reinforcing these nationalist uh, views on, on free movement in West Africa and creating a, a, a situation where there are now more restrictive um, understandings of free movement and the more restrictive uh, narratives on free movement are now dominant uh, in the region. Uh, and as Melissa said, this risk undermining the implementation um, of, of the ECOWAS uh, free movement protocol. So I think all in all, um, the, the work that I tried to do um, was to observe these different narratives, look at how they interact um, at the national level, at the regional level, um, look at also how external uh, influences like the, the EU narratives contribute to uh, um, the, the focus now on, on more restrictive uh, um, narratives around free movement uh, and how these translate into international uh, uh, policies. But again, contrasting these narratives with the realities that people face every day, um, we still see that uh, across border transactions still go on, people still move irrespective of restrictive or liberal policies policies, the realities of the borders and the fluidity of movement in the region is such that people still move whether or not these uh, uh, narratives are in place. So the question is, will the policies uh, um, eventually catch up with the realities uh, of, of movement um, in the region? Thank you. Um, thanks, Amanda, for such an interesting presentation. Uh, particularly how you delineated the different narratives shaping political and social responses to freedom of movement. Um, the, the table you did was very helpful because it's very clear to see, you know, who is behind um, what narrative. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll now call Germach for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for uh, the invitation. And last session and last speaker. Moving from West Africa to the East, and uh, I'll talk about the narratives in uh, Eastern part of Africa, mainly the Horn of Africa region. So the previous speakers makes uh, my job easier since yesterday. So I'm not giving much context into uh, the migration trend and dynamics in Africa, but there is um, a mounting evidence that suggests uh, migrants in Africa move mainly within the continent instead of crossing oceans. But the misperception and distortion is that many Africans migrate towards Europe. That is overshadowing intra-African migration, which is the most dominant uh, migration dynamics in Africa. Um, and the latest migration report in 2020, Africa Migration Report, the first ever, its title say, says, challenging the narrative, because there is a lot of distortions. There was a lot of different narratives and that migration report by African Union and IOM, they tried to challenge the narrative and shift the narratives 
uh, that Africa is, is not the largest in terms of intercontinental uh, migration. It only contributed 14% of the total uh, world migration. Uh, it is far low compared to Asia, 41%. And Europe, always considered as um, a, a destination country, but it's also 27.1%. So most Africans are not crossing oceans. If they do, they do it regularly, 94%. 94% of African migrants crossing the oceans, they cross uh, on a regular basis. But the narrative is Africans tend to irregularly migrate uh, towards the Gulf, towards Europe, or other parts of the world. And if you look at the trend, uh, intra-Africa migration is faster, growing faster. In 2015, it was 16, 17% million. Now in 2020, it's about um, 18 million and 46% compared to 26% 20, growth uh, compared to Africa-Europe migration. So East Africa migration, it is called mixed migration. That's a narrative. Even we have a center called mixed migration center because Africa, East Africa is uh, a migration hub for refugees for economic migrants, for returnees, and uh, all sorts of migrants. Unlike West Africa, in East Africa, the narrative is victimization and humanitarian, because this part of Africa is known for sending migrants, mainly refugees, and also um, accepting or receiving uh, many refugees. The top three, uh, refugee receiving countries in Africa found in this part of Africa, like Uganda is the first one, Sudan, second one, Ethiopia is the third largest refugee receiving countries. But at the same time, they also generate a lot of refugees from this region. That's why the narrative focusing mainly on refugees, but not necessarily as refugees sending, I mean, receiving countries, but as, um, uh, re refugee sending countries because many refugees stay within the continent but Africa is always perceived as the largest producer in terms of refugees so uh, migration from and within the Horn of Africa is very complex and there are three major migration routes in that region the first one is east toward towards the Gulf countries mainly Saudi Arabia second one is migration towards the south, southern part of Africa, South Africa. And the least one is the northern route to uh, cross the Mediterranean Trans-Saharan migration, which contributed only a few, only 1%. But if you look at media policy programming, it's focusing on that route. That's why I'm also focusing uh, that 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 migration route. Um, for example, in 2021, according to the uh, IOM um, counting, 50% of all over of overall movements in the Horn of Africa region from the Horn of Africa region, and 50% stays within the region. They are mainly uh, refugees, actually. The other 40% moved towards uh, the Gulf countries, 9% towards South Africa, only 1% towards uh, the Sahara and Trans-Mediterranean. But if you look at the discourse, media, migration, policy, research, is focusing only on that migration corridor, which is not um, significant in terms of volume of migrants uh, using that route, including uh, Ethiopia. But if you look at most of the migration policies or migration programs, media reports and research, it's focusing only as if East African migrants are moving towards the Sahara, crossing the Mediterranean. And those who are using that route is not crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Look, for example, Ethiopia. Sudan is the fourth largest migrant destination for Ethiopian migrants. That means 
everyone using that route is not ultimately intending to migrate to Europe, crossing the Mediterranean. Libya before Gaddafi, the collapse of the Gaddafi regime was a favorite destination for many uh, migrants from the Horn of Africa region, from the Sahel and as well as West Africa. So uh, the perception is a bit different. So the Africa-Europe migration is dominated by irregular migration. That is a narrative, but mostly uh, migrants are um, going for family, for education, for jobs on a regular basis. There is cooperation between Ethiopia, I mean Africa and East Africa mainly, or the Horn of Africa region with European Union. It's not uh, specifically to this part of Africa, but across the region, I, I could say. But the priorities differ. For example, for Europeans, it is about border security, border management, but for East African uh, governments and civil society, they thought about in terms of opportunities, development opportunities, in terms of remittances, in terms of regional integration, and sometimes politics. Because the diaspora, the African diaspora is considered as the sixth region of Africa that is officially recognized by the African Union. And uh, migration is often seen in terms of development, in terms of opportunity, in terms of remittances, and also to a certain extent, skill and knowledge transfer. What is the implication of these narratives on migration policy and programming? That is the focus of my, 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 my paper here, uh, because I was also involved in some of the programs there. So more interventions aiming to restrain sub-Saharan migration to Europe, that is the ultimate uh, underlying narrative. And this perception drives policy and policy making on immigration and asylum seeking is to a significant extent motivated by prevailing public attitudes. Although there is no evidence that suggests that the wider public support restrictive refugee protection regimes. Um, and this distorted image and reality is also uh, perpetuated by local media. Local media in Ethiopia, local media in Kenya or Sudan or Somalia, they reproduce global media news outlets. They tend to um, choose or identify storylines which is in line with the destination country priorities or uh, policies. So Europe's focus on controlling migration from Africa may have affected its broader development assistant. And quite recently, targeting those areas, those countries, which are strategically important for migration. It's not in terms of development needs, but also in terms of their strategic importance, in terms of controlling migration. That's why Ethiopia is chosen, because Ethiopia is not sending large number of migrants to Europe, but it is strategically uh, it's located in a transit country for Somalis, for Eritreans, to a certain extent moving towards Europe, Southern Europe, because uh, they assume that they will get uh, um, a refugee status in, 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 in that part of the world. And another important um, focus is return readmission, where no African government is interested to hear about return from Europe, undocumented migrants from Europe. And, um, People I interviewed, they say that this is uh, worth talking about in its own right, but they don't want to be attached with some development cooperation. If you are willing to readmit undocumented migrants, we are going to invest on this and that. So such kind of preconditions are not really accepted, uh, welcomed by African governments. It's not only that, but also uh, local criticism and losing remittances, uh, as well as uh, in some cases, for example, in Toronto, for example, or in Washington DC, or in New York or Brussels, you can see demonstrations, Ethiopian diaspora, one is in favor, the other is against. So such kind of politically motivated um, 
migration also has its own uh, implication. And if I mention some of the programs, for example, AU Horn of Africa Initiative, the cartoon process, the better migration management, the emergency trust fund for Africa. I'm not going uh, in detail in terms of uh, to in the interest of time. So all this reduced into preventing irregular migration, addressing the root causes, return and readmission. These all programs are run in East Africa, in Somalia, in Sudan, in Ethiopia, in Uganda as well. So the aim is to 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 address the root cause of irregular migration and to combat human human trafficking, smuggling. For me, it is very exaggerated. In certain places in Ethiopia, smugglers are positively perceived by local communities. They consider themselves as agents of social change, door openers, especially in Southern Ethiopia, South Africa migration corridor. They are not like criminal networks, but they are friends, family who involve in day-to-day -day social life. The Team Europe Initiative, uh, all these are also focusing on the root causes. That means migration is uh, perceived as a problem to be solved through management, not migration governance. Um, so the established migration narrative from the Horn of Africa region is increasingly moving towards Europe on an irregular basis, but that's not the case. And unfortunately, migration programming in the region is adding to the oversimplification of the otherwise complex migration trajectories. There is a risk that simplistic narrative lead to inadequate responses. And the root causes, they are different. They are assumed to be poverty, but it goes beyond that environment gender, culture, um, pooling factors, like social connections, diaspora networks, all these have contributed for people's mobility, but um, poverty is often assumed to be a single cause of migration. And East African migrants are characterized as vulnerable people who are simply manipulated by criminal smugglers, stressing the importance of breaking their networks. If you look at institutions, national regional um, cooperation um, mechanisms, coordination mechanisms, they are all in line with European priorities and uh, program and policy priorities. It is just a direct mirroring the, the priorities of uh, destination countries. And we have, for example, in Ethiopia or in Kenya or in Uganda, you have got national anti-trafficking human smuggling task force led by deputy prime minister or some high uh, at political level, you will see all migration policies being drafted and there are some initiatives, but these are donor driven. And the focus is like on migration management in Africa and also facilitating return, readmission, reintegration of migrant workers. But they know exactly what they are doing, but sometimes behind those projects is a lot of money, European, uh, trust fund for Africa, emergency trust fund. If you ask the name, it is a crisis, and crisis will be addressed through providing emergency relief. You know, so migration is addressed that way in a very short term um, and oversimplified um, narratives. And the non-economic dimension is missed, and pull factors are also not in the equation of migration discourse. Uh, so it has prioritized EU interests, which focus on migration management rather than migration governance. And border securitization is also a concern among African countries. There is a lot of resistance, even within Africa, inter-Africa mobility. You, you, have, you have got walls between Zimbabwe and South Africa during COVID time, if you remember. And it is really very difficult to even move within the continent. A lot of violence, detentions um, across the continent. Um, so I would argue that this fear of invasion, especially programs implicate implications in Horn of Africa region is not only uh, focusing on a few number of migrants crossing the Mediterranean, but that emanates mainly from a long-term projection of demographic growth coupled with limited economic opportunities. So in the future, 
with low opportunities, with more population, irregular migration will be unchecked unless we intervene now. That is the, the, the broader narrative, I think. So many current policies dealing with irregular smuggled migration breach international agreements and conventions. And the focus should be on widening safe legal pathways for labor migration and uh, providing local livelihood alternatives at the same time. Uh, more on migration governance over securitization, positive narratives, if there is one, we need to capitalize on that. And it's important to decentering migration governance, also decolonizing knowledge. And we have got emerging migration research institutes in Africa, those also supported by uh, IDRC, right? So if these uh, local institutions have the privilege and the resources to set their own agenda and do research projects in line with government and regional priorities, then they have the potential to change the current narrative. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for such a, an informative uh, presentation. Uh, specifically the uh, points you, um, the statistics you put to dispel certain uh, myths that kind of surround uh, Horn of Africa migration. Um, at this moment, I'd like to thank all the speakers for sharing their um, very interesting and um, very insightful work with us today. And we'll now open the floor for questions. Um, we will take questions from the room first. And um, in keeping with the tradition of the, of the um, conference, we'll then follow with questions from the online audience. Thank you. Uh, if I can, yeah, start, start the discussion. First of all, thank you for very important, very interesting presentations. I, I have a couple of questions in, in a way to to all speakers, but not everyone has to address. So uh, I I really like the the distinction that I think it was mostly Melissa introduced about uh, the external and the internal narrative. So I'm asking, what is an external narrative in a region where you know, colonization and, you know, post-colonial dependence is continuing. And I, I, I am, I know some things about related discourses in the Middle East where they're also asking, you know, what is internal and external when, um, you know, for, foreign involvement has been part and parcel of the internal. Uh, so that is one question. The other question I think that um, um, is arising is very interesting is not only juxtaposing of obviously the narratives of different interested actors that also um, all four of you uh, mentioned, but how can we uh, juxtapose the narratives of the private citizen or their families? And we heard also uh, from Mary on, on, on gender and those of institutional actors and in terms of analytical perspectives or methodologies, are these different genres of narratives completely different or how can we uh, meaningfully uh, build on them? And last, but uh, my last question is, um, I, what is your take on the transnational traveling of narratives? Because um, I think it is too easy to say, oh, they're, they're I mean, yeah. Um, I, I totally agree that the EU is both imposing policies and also imposing narratives, but I'm thinking it's more complex than that because some of these narratives then take their own lives and there are probably become tools, uh, for instance, between neighboring countries or countries in the same region or among ministries or among different actors uh, in the governance uh, field who then will, uh, you know, seek to further implement them for their own more specific interests. So. Th thanks very much for this. It's really nice to hear these counter narratives and um, reflections from from the African continent. I'm curious. I think Amanda said, "When are the when are the policies going to catch up with the realities?" of African of movements around, across the continent. And the direction of travel seems to be going the wrong way. And there's, a, you know, so I wonder how do you, maybe it's echoing some of what Anna was saying, how do, the, how do you get these counter narratives 
in do where do you create the space for them to be heard and for them to be taken up it feels as if there's there's almost an industry around reproducing and recreating there's a lot of interest at stake in working on securitization working on um you know counter trafficking and the, all these different things um, may be exemplified by the eu trust funds work um and it's very much tied into the de the development agenda which has been skewed by discussions about migration very often across africa so yeah can you see any strategies for finding space for the counter narratives where it's saying because and i many of the things you say are not new you know we've heard that i've heard these in other discussions but it's it doesn't come into the the policy framework enough and particularly i'd be interested to hear a bit about what's the role of academia in this and uh, yeah, academics um academic institutions who are often tied up into both sides of the story because capacity building and um all sorts of research is funded by by the EU, by funded by external bodies, who come with a particular agenda and particular set of ideas. So some reflections of that would be really helpful. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, I would like to say something, just a very fast commentary uh, to complement what we have heard. Uh, I'm from South America and uh in south america currently we're having this uh situation regarding venezuela uh, human mobility across all the continent and we have heard how this crisis has developed from a humanitarian crisis to a refugee and migrant crisis and then to a politic crisis and uh, hearing you from africa and hearing everything that's going out in the other side of the global south uh i was wondering we are also trying to build our own decolonization uh, rela uh narratives in south america how we uh how the migration was instrumentalized by the political view in south america against uh one point of view in the politics in the continent and how all these narrative around uh, what was happening uh put aside the humanitarian crisis and the refugee crisis and become about the political crisis, but not about the people, but about the politics. So uh, saying that, uh, I heard a lot of things that we have in common with Africa, facing the realities and the challenges about migration and human mobility. But at least in my experience, we haven't shared experience on realities with Africa and with South America. Uh, we are really close so this is like a more a provocative question for you and even for me as a scholar from south america and someone that works with migration in south america how we can close the gaps between the global south narratives and how can we bond them because we always are looking for the north uh not global north situation and narratives but we are not looking for our own narratives and how can we come more together uh as I can say, it's a more provocative question. How can we uh, be more close in these global south narratives? Thank you. Hi, I guess I can go now. Yeah. Hi, thank you all. Um, I had a, a two different questions, um, and I think they build off some of the other uh, comments and questions from Anna and Oliver. The first one is um, for uh, in different ways, I guess, Melissa and Mary, uh, you both described um, what seemed like pretty uh, paternalistic narratives of, um, on the one hand, thinking about uh, women as uh, migrants, and then on the other hand, uh, the European kind of external narratives of uh, migration to Europe. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about who are the actors that are perpetuating these narratives and what are the motivations that they uh, have for kind of presenting these approaches? And uh, maybe in the case of Mary as well, um, are there like cultural sources or maybe religious sources that are the ones that are uh, perpetuating these kind of paternalistic patriarchal narratives uh, around women migrants? And then the second question is for Amanda and it's on 
I was really interested in kind of the contesting narratives that you have between the uh, regional courts and the regional policymakers and those presented by the state. And I don't really know what to make of them. And I'm curious what you make of these different narratives, because presumably a lot of these regional policymaking institutions are made up of uh, people that come from these different states, and yet they're kind of giving very different ideas of uh, what freedom of movement means and its consequences. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, area of, uh, the, of your ideas and what you, you presented. I come back to what uh, Amanda said when she did sp spoke about the, about the norms and the exception in Africa and in, in Ghana and other countries. It's not, the, it's not the norm, but it's a norm to migrate, it's a norm, it's a human right, it's a fundamental human right, and it should be the same everywhere, in Africa, uh, as in Europe, as in Asia, and, and this is one of the things which is now, today, uh, at the base of the this inequality between the North and the South, between humankind, and it's important to say that mobility, it's not an exception, it's a norm, it's a right. Now, what Mary said about, uh, about uh, African gender, Af African uh, the gen mobility of gender or gender migration. I think that it's the same thing also in North Africa. And I want I want to add another element is that many of women today, or let's say modern women today, are moving because there are an inequality in the religious approach. For example, for the heritages. For example, for the uh, the personal right and and code and so they are fleeing from their countries from algeria from from uh, uh, egypt from sudan from tunisia or morocco for having equality with the man at least on heritage and it's a very important at the global in the global approach to don't speak about let's them they have exceptional culture exceptional uh, situation we don't have to speak about exception we do have to speak about the global right for all women everywhere. And that could be, actually have to be the approach of, uh, of the association of global. And now there was a question, what can we do according to our situation? I, I think that Mary, as our friend from, from Ethiopia, as Amanda, and uh, many of the other communicate here, uh, know the field in Africa. They know the reality as they are li they live there or they, they were born there. And now my counsel is my my advice for a searcher from the north and also from, for a, uh, political and governmental responsible from the EU, from uh, Canad Canadian, uh, American, uh, to visit Africa, to visit countries like or parts of countries like uh, uh, Gao, in to visit Arlit in Niger, to visit uh, Djibouti in the Horn Africa, or to visit Marrakesh, not only in the high uh, the high standard hotel, but go to to the field to poor country to poor part. What is really? Oh, have you to? It's a information according to second hand data. They, know, they have to know what is the real situation and what is, for example, the link between the European policy in agriculture or the European policy protecting agriculture or protecting some sectors also in Canada or in, in the United States and what is the reality of such the same sectors in Africa and that at that time they could have a real and the true uh, narrative according to the real situation. Thanks. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much for the really interesting panel. Uh, I have a question to Mary, also complimenting on what Nick said. So um, I'm really curious to know um, 
when it comes, considering the high number of youth migrants that we have specifically on Africa and internal migrants, uh, I really would like to know in terms of like the gender um, dynamics, if there is anything uh, coming on from civil society and youth led movements in order to support the advancement of these local politics. And also when it comes to the relationship between local actors, how is civil society also uh, bringing and participating in those conversations? Um, we'll take one more question because there are questions from the online audience. <laughs> Thank you so very much for this uh, wonderful, very rich presentation and uh, highlighting all the complexities, explaining how, you know, the different layers and levels. Um, uh, my question was uh, related to the, what about the development related narratives and migration related narratives? Um, you know, is there a, a contradiction? Are there paradoxes? Is there a dovetailing? And in also the second part is really as researchers and also because so many INGOs and NGOs work in this, in, in, in the, you know, context. So what about um, the role? Um, is there a way for, um, you know, academics and the uh, other sectors, stakeholders to come together to be able to kind of tease out um, and even, you know, when we go towards problem solving, I don't know, this is, it's, a, it, I'm not really forming my question well, but just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we can address the questions and then we'll take the questions from the online audience. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. So I'll, um, I'll respond firstly to your question, Anna, about external narratives in a region of um, uh, post-colonialism. So, of course, um, and I think I think Amanda explained it quite well, actually, in her presentation, um, how mobility really has been the norm in this region um, for um, for a very long time. Um, and that this norm far predates uh, European uh, interventions in the region in migration governance. Um, so West Africans have long considered uh, their region as a, um, as a place to move in freely. Um, and this is often taken the form of um, trade routes uh, dating back to um, centuries ago. Um, but then at the same time, um, um, European efforts to control African mobility also date back to um, colonialism um, and uh, and we can really see um, the current you know current European efforts to control African mobility to be um, a continuation in some ways of um, of that pro problematic history. Um, I'd like to also pick up on um, uh, Oliver's uh, points about space for counter narratives. Um, and whether policies are actually, um, will they finally catch up with the reality on the ground? Um, so I'm actually, I'm actually quite cynical on that because I think um, if we look at some of the um, some of the policies, some of the interventions that are being uh, undertaken, for example, I talked about Ghana um, and how local voices are being used in dissuasion campaigns. Um, I think actually there's not much to say that these uh, these types of interventions, these types of projects are actually effective. Um, so it's really also a case of um, European or other external actors um, putting in place mig migration governance projects uh, um, that are not, you know, firstly question morally questionable, but also um, they're not even shown to be effective. Um, so what does that mean for audiences at home, for taxpayers at home, where millions of um, millions of euros are, are being um, put into these types of um, ideas? Uh, so that um, that is perhaps a bit of a cynical take, but um, there you go. Um, and then also um, someone asked about um, who who are, are the uh, who's the EU as an actor? Um, who are the actors um, creating these narratives? Um, so in the case of, well, the EU, it's actually um, uh, 
Previously, a lot of migration governance or cooperation with African countries uh, would take place through bilateral uh, cooperation mechanisms. Uh, so France would uh, cooperate um, or try and govern migration through, through its bilateral uh, relations, uh, often with former colonies. Um, um, and so the EU is, is in some ways a relatively recent player in, in the migration governance um, uh, scheme. Um, certainly since the Tampere Agreement, which I think was in the early 90s. Um, and so it's really trying to push uh, to become more of a prominent actor in migration governance in, Af in Africa. Um, and we really do see that some European states um, try to push that agenda in, in the direction of a more restrictive, in a more restrictive direction. Um, and that's also certainly a feature of, of the EU as an actor. Thank you very much for all the questions. I, I hope I can touch on at least all of them. Okay, so um, the question which I asked myself was, um, are these narratives from privates, institutional? I, I did ask myself that question and I noted that it was complex. So I rather created a slide and put everybody there. So institutions, CSOs, everybody, because I realized that the cultural part makes it embedded from the family level, so at the individual level. So right from the individual level, these narratives are built. And so currently the government, for instance, has migration in the curriculum. And I tried to ask my little girl, what is migration? And she said, is the movement of, um, somebody i mean moving moving from somewhere with things to another place and that is the prime the basic level so the government has tried to integrate some migration definitions but towards a particular direction and so i think it, it starts from right i mean as we have all said pre-colonial colonial it has always been there it has, it's a historical thing coupled with the cultural part so i think most of the time what i think i'm i'm trying to argue for is Beyond all the discussions, there is a cultural component and it makes it difficult to talk without it. And so we have had proverbs, songs that depict migration as a privileged position. So right now, if I, I mean, when you go, you move and move outside, you move two days, you come back, everybody thinks it's a good thing. So there is culturally, even without going to international migration or whatever, even when you move internally from one city to the other and you come back, so long as you have been away for that three days or thing, there is a certain perception towards that. And that is what has moved on to this level and has eaten into the current contemporary discourses that we are talking about. So I think it's a mixture of the private and the institutions picking up what um, these discourses are and making them shaping the narratives that we have. And then role of academics. Well, we have our own challenges, I wouldn't rule out, but I don't think it's all bad. At least there is some good news to it. The fact that I am consulted to work on a policy for a government, which usually would have been European, it would have been somebody from Western country. So the fact that now they are looking inside, it's, it's a good thing that we need to agree with. And then we move on to talk about the other sides. So it's a gradual process. So let me talk about the gender thing. So for instance, I mean, those of you who teach gender, gender looks so complicated for a lot of students and even for adults. And so one, they don't even see, I remember we're developing instruments, at one of our big projects, and I said, let's develop gender. And they said, no, 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 it's complicated. We are taking too long. Let's, let's be quiet on it. Then when they go to the field, they see what they do. So people find it so complicated when they want to talk about. So it has layers of things that you have to deal with. And so, well, I think the role, we, we are not necessarily purpose taking whatever is coming to us. I think we have a voice. At least we, we are claim, we are making people have ownership. What's the process of policy making? There is consultation. I have been to countries where they tell me, this is not our migration, we don't want it. And indeed, they don't want it. They will not take it. 
I can consult for two days, three days. They will tell me, yeah, we understand the issues now will continue. Your work is done. You move on. So there is some agency there. There's some ownership there. And so I wouldn't think that I, I, for, from where I stand and from my experience, I think there is, a, there is a better future. And then in terms of development, it depends on how you are defining development. It is okay if the policies also want to focus on development because after all, we need development in our various countries. But making that the only agenda, that is where the problem is. And also, how do you define development? Is it just economic? Uh, we should broaden development. I'm a sociologist. I think of development more broadly, uh, the social part and all the other cultural and all the other components. So when we think about it broadly, which unfortunately governments only talk about the economic part where they can measure. So that makes it a problem. But if we can think broadly about it, then I don't think migration and development has a negative connotation. No, we can rather think of how to broaden development so that it becomes an agenda that helps everybody. I think the question about um, role of civil society. So if I'm doing another project with colleagues in Senegal, if you compare Ghana with Senegal, the role of CSOs are very minimal. And I think there are several reasons that account for that. So in Ghana, yes, there are CSOs, but coming together to fight for agenda like Gambia, Senegal, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, for I don't know for whatever reason it is, but that is also because most of the migrations are embarked on by individuals. We don't have corporate migration where people are moving in volumes, um, volumes arranged migration. Most people, and it's also a superstitious thing. There's also a cultural dimension. You don't tell somebody you are moving because anything can happen on the road. So it, it's, um, it, <laughs> something may happen somehow. I go to the airport. The last time I traveled, I told everybody, even me as an academic, I stopped a moment to think, maybe because I told everybody this time I was going, so I was returned from the airport. Suddenly I go to the airport and I didn't have my visa with me. Suddenly, it has never happened before. So, I mean, you can think of an ordinary youth who is migrating and then thinking about the fact that I can be deported. He's not going to discuss it. So most people still have a superstitious idea towards so that even during census, you ask somebody, do you have a migrant? They will say no, because they don't want to talk about it. It's something that is sacred to them until the person has succeeded. That is when they want to talk about it. And so in, I think the cultural part, the, the youth migration, yeah, that is still about it. And then in terms of whether the gender dynamics, well, so both most young men and women are moving. I think I had an interview on radio and I told them the youth is under pressure to produce and make sure that they look after their elderly. We are social security to our parents. And so whichever way, especially the male, so yes, I talked about the narratives. In as much as women are considered the way they are considered, I think there's a lot of pressure on the male youth because they have to perform. And that performance leads them to take any decision at all. Well, so looking at that dimension, but again, internal migration, there's also a lot of internal migration issues going on. Women are moving, men are moving. There is that dynamics, everybody is moving, just that, in terms of the numbers, depending on which angle you are talking about, you may have more females or more males depending on the, the context. I, I'm not sure if I answered that question, well, but let me leave it here. Um, I think there was a question. I think I've sort of um, touched on all the issues, but please, if I didn't, I can discuss further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for all the questions. Um, okay, so I think I'll start with uh, the external in, internal narratives and post-colonial discourses. M M M Melissa touched on that. Um, and, and what I would like to highlight here is also um, the, the discussions on, on Pan-Africanism that sort of died down 
um, but uh, are coming up again, especially in the context of the African um, Continental Free Trade Agreement. And here the, the links between that and improving the mobility of, of people on the continent. So I'll, I'll refer to a, a statement made by the president of Kenya a, a few days ago in, in the launch of, of a report where he said, look, the important thing is for people and goods to be able to move on the continent. And in this continent, these borders that have been created are not ours. So we need to work towards uh, bringing down these borders. So while there is, of course, the, the, the reality of colonialism and the reality of these post-colonial influences on, on migration, there's also a strong resistance uh, to uh, um, these, these discourses. At the same time, there are also really um, strong national interests that drive uh, the discussions around uh, um, uh, uh, migration and mobility in continents, which is where you see, and, and in the paper I talk about this, the ambiguity and the contestations between the different narratives. So while a country is interested in promoting the mobility of people linked to economic development, uh, linked to the Pan-African agenda, um, there are also interests, uh, security interests that need to be considered. There are also interests uh, in terms of uh, a competition between the domestic labor force and uh, and and possible migrant labor uh, that also need to need to be considered. So the interactions of these different narratives uh, in terms of how it plays out um, in 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 the reality uh, is really complex. Okay, uh, and then if we look at uh, the question on trans transnational traveling of narratives and how these uh, narratives take on their lives and become tools, um, I think for me, this is where I make the point in the paper that uh, with the introduction of this really uh, a focused, restrictive uh, form of, 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 of mobility and that is, that is being pushed uh, by the EU in the region, it's it's being taken up by the political elites and uh, it aligns with the nationalist uh, narratives on free movement, which in and of themselves are not bad, because if you look at some of these uh, nationalists uh, interests on on free movement, they also look at uh, a prioritizing bilateral relations with specific countries as opposed to uh, regional cooperation. Um, and so trying to look, uh, trying to gain uh, privileges in labor mobility uh, or in other aspects, trying to gain privileges for their citizens as opposed to um, other, other uh, countries in the region. Um, but we see that these national narratives are being reinforced by uh, these external influences. So while uh, you're trying to promote uh, a certain uh, uh, certain narratives in the region, they are picked up by, by the political elite and serve to reinforce the discussions uh, on, on on, uh, on, 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 on restrictive mobility practices. An example from, from Ghana would be uh, the Ghana Immigration Service uh, releasing a poster saying, is your tenant an immigrant? Is, the, is, is, the, is, is your tenant legal? Uh, make sure you check with, with, uh, with the, the Ghana Immigration Service or do not rent your house uh, out to uh, an, an illegal uh, migrant um, trying, you know, and, and this is, if you look at this, it's linked in a way to some discussion that has been funded by the EUTF or some discussion um, that has been that has been funded by by donors. Um, so yes, this these narratives eventually take a life on their own and are used uh, uh, by by uh, by by um, by political elites in reinforcing certain discourses around uh, negative perceptions of, of migration. Okay, um, uh, on the point of creating space for counter narratives, I think in the region we've also we also have uh, really good examples of counter narratives uh, from from Mali, uh, for example, where uh, um, there was a protest against uh, Mali signing a bilateral uh, readmission agreement with France. There was a huge protest in in Bamako that led to to the Malian government not signing uh, that readmission agreement um, because part of the discussions were around uh, remittances, part of the discussion were around uh, um, not having uh, uh, return programs for, for these uh, uh, Malians who 
possibly may may or may not be returned from France. And so there was there was a huge movement on that in Gambia. Um, also, like I think has been referred to in this panel um, when when there was a focus on on returns from 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 the EU, specifically from Germany. At some point, the Gambian government had to issue a moratorium against uh, returning uh, uh, migrants to. Uh, receive, receiving returned migrants from Europe because it was creating a politically difficult situation domestically. Uh, and so that was, of course, led by uh, uh, um, mig returning, returning migrant groups that were protesting um, the, the, their treatment uh, on their return to, to, uh, to, to the Gambia. In Senegal also, there's a lot of activism around uh, around uh, migration issues uh, and, and around driving driving a, a, a positive uh, migration narrative. So while you have this IOM-led uh, uh, initiative that looks at uh, migrants uh, as returnees that, that Melissa discussed in, in the case of Ghana, in, in, in Senegal, you have uh, uh, civil society organizations who actually uh, bring returning migrants to speak about their positive experiences and so not about their negative, not about their negative experiences, but sort of countering uh, this IOM narrative to say, look, if, if migration is done right, then there are positive benefits. Don't, don't, we just don't think that uh, the only stories to hear are sad stories of deportation and return. If migration is done right, then there, there are certain narratives. So, so we see a lot of uh, uh, counter narratives, but the problem is that the space for the engagement of these civil society organizations and these migrant rights groups is shrinking <laughs> because they're not the popular voices. So they're not the ones invited to the donor funded meetings. They're not the ones invited to engage with the governments, but they're also creating an alternative space for engaging among themselves. And that space is, is growing. So the question is which government would be brave enough to, to engage with them and not not throw them in jail, as was the case in Niger um, a few years ago. Um, if we look at the similarities between uh, between uh, um, uh, migration in South America and migration in Africa, I think there are a few projects that uh, that look at uh, the similarities of, uh, for example, the free movement regimes in South America and and in Africa. So we can discuss we can discuss a bit more about that because I'm in contact with some of with some of those projects. So it's interesting because what they try to do is also highlight the similarities. And see uh, where uh, where some there's some basis for for comparison and and the lessons that can be learned uh, from from the different examples. For example, in in, in Mercosur, um, yeah, I think the course, I had the specific question about uh, contesting narratives between the regional courts and the policymakers. Um, so I, I think that the the main issue here is that when you see these different narratives interacting between themselves, or it, when you see these different narratives interacting, um, the result of it is some sort of ambiguity uh, between the the various policies. So on the one hand, you have the regional court saying. Um, mobility is a right, mobility should be respected, uh, uh, the rights of migrants should be protected. On the other hand, uh, you have the policymakers whose interests are driven by uh, domestic uh, domestic policies saying, well, yes, we understand that mobility is a right, we understand that we have to protect it, but we also have, for example, the interests of the traders to consider, uh, the interest of the, of the uh, 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 labor, domestic labor force to consider, or security interests, uh, which, which are genuine interests also now given uh, the, 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 rising, the rising terrorism in the region to consider. And so balancing these different narratives, I think, is is a challenge uh, um, in in the region? Um, yeah, I think I have responded to to most of the questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think every question is answered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will take one, the last one, development related narratives that is missing in the migration discourse. That's mainly because the focus has been on irregular migration, not even on regular migration. What are the legal pathways? The cheapest and also less risky, although it's not ab absolutely perfect in terms of risks, even if you take regular passes, there are sort of risks. And when 
we think of migration development, the nexus, remittances is uh, the, the main linkage there. And African countries and governments are struggling, working hard to receive those kind of uh, um, capital from abroad. But the main problem there is um, we have got uh, global compact, all frameworks reducing remittance costs, all in paper, in policy. There is um, a framework. However, skills transfer, knowledge transfer, that should be also questioned. Migrating abroad doesn't mean that that migrant or a diaspora have acquired some skills or experiences, which is relevant to the local communities in Ethiopia or elsewhere in Africa, other African countries. So in order to uh, promote this migration development nexus, the, 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 the discussion should be who should be benefited from this, how to maximize the benefit of migration to migrants, their families, sending countries, receiving countries. In that case, it is a win-win scenario. Otherwise, if the focus is on containing refugees within a given region or also preventing people from migrating on a regular or regular basis, no one stops migration, but we need to reduce the risks associated with migration and also understand how migration can benefit uh, local sending communities and families and how to maximize that. And there are also lessons in Asia, for example, or in other countries. So taking lessons and bringing the positive light into this discourse is important. Whenever there is a campaign, the campaign is how to prevent irregular migration, not how to promote labor migration on safe, regular, ways and so on. So when the focus has been on deterring migration, irregular migration, then the migration development linkage is missing, has been uh, not in at least in, in the agenda, and in the public agenda or in media and so on. Um, otherwise, in the sustainable development goals or in compacts, RRF, the, there are strategies how to uh, maximize these benefits for all parties involved. And the focus should be on that. And uh, there are a lot of migration scholars working in Western countries who are really having uh, given the reality uh, what's going on in Africa. They have written and also did presentations and we learned a lot even from non-African scholars who has been spending many years writing about African migration. So a narrative shouldn't be left for those in the global South, but also uh, in institutions in the global North like this one. This is what we're doing now. Constructing, reconstructing, deconstructing existing narratives. So it is the role of all, I think, migration scholars should focus on giving the reality and also data is another important challenge in Africa. And in order to come up with a good policy, we need to have data. And also, all those policies need to be uh, aligned with development priorities, continental, national, regional state development priorities. Otherwise, migration couldn't be addressed. If it is specifically addressing about migration, it should be seen within the broader development socioeconomic processes in Africa both in sending, uh, receiving, also transit countries. Um, and thank you. Um, I think there's questions from the online audience. Yes, um, thank you so much. And first of all, on behalf of the online audience, I would like to thank you, like all the presenters for excellent and also very insightful presentations. There are a few questions uh, in the chat box, but I'll just um, ask a couple from there. 
Um, and the first question is for Amanda, but other presenters are also welcome to share their thoughts. Um, Amanda, your presentation was focused on narratives, but could you elaborate on the impact of actual EU-sponsored projects in West Africa to fund, equip, train states um, to intensify border control on ECOWAS practice? Do people complain that these EU-sponsored initiatives undermine attainment of uh, ECOWAS free movement goals. And the second question is also kind of like related to free mobility within the ECOWAS region. Does this free mobility also mean free labor mobility within the region? So um, uh, Raz has posed this question and he is from the Caribbean and where they have free mobility within 14 English speaking uh, member states, uh, but that involves essentially visa free travel within the region by nationals of the member states. But to work in one of the member states, one must obtain work visa. Um, and then there is another question that um, how can the power of donors to drive the narratives, the policies, the programs, and clearly the funding priorities be mitigated and countered? And these are the big questions. So maybe we can, yeah, start with these. Um. So I, I will actually pick up on part of the first question, uh, which was for, um, I think for Amanda, but maybe also for the whole panel. Um, so how do EU border control initiatives, how are those received by other actors also in uh, in West Africa? Um, so my, my research also looks at um, border control policies uh, of European actors in Senegal, as well as Ghana. Um, and similarly to what Mary was um, was saying earlier, is that, um, for instance, in Senegal, there is a much more politically active um, civil society organized, um, well, civil, there's more politically active civil society organizations than I found in Ghana. Um, and actually they were very, um, some of them were very active in countering these um, solid border notions in, uh, in the Senegalese context. Um, they were also, um, somewhat effective in um, organizing with similar civil society organizations in other West African countries to make it more of a trans um, transnational initiative. Um, so just to say that there are um, there are other actors active in countering these um, these border control efforts. Um, and the question of what can uh, what can donors do in terms of um, priorities? Uh, I think that's a very good question. Um, and I think it does come back to the question of um, perhaps trying to actively, uh, more systematically um, deconstructing these narratives and challenging, challenging them, uh, them where we can. And um, yes, just to do this in a very much more systematic way. Um, and I think um, accounting for that in, um, in proposals as well is certainly perhaps a way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so how do we, I think these are broad questions. So um, how do, about the free movement? So the, what we are having now is just the movement. The rest, we hope to get there. And I think that, that's, that's a work of Amanda. What, that's what she was, she's trying to do. And I also depicted that even with the movement, there are still challenges. <laughs> so we haven't gone past the movement yet. So there are about three components. There are three components. There is the right of residence and all. That. But we haven't passed. There are three. We, have we are just at the movement. So in terms of labor, so there was a study that last year we did. Um, um, I was part of those who did scoping study on how to transfer skills within the West African content, the con um, context. One, skills recognition. So I have a certificate in Ghana, which cannot easily be translated into the Francophone country. So there is a problem there. So I can move. So most people are in the informal sector because it's easier. So these cross-border women I'm talking about, it's easy for me to go to Burkina Faso to say I'm buying tomatoes and come and sell. I'm buying salmon. 
fish of all kinds to come and sell. But when it comes to formal, I mean, formal qualification, it is not that simple to translate what you have within. And so there is, we, that's what um, now we are trying to see within, uh, among ourselves, how do we transfer skills at, of all levels, whether low, high, medium, we need to think about how to transfer skills in, the con in that context. So there's a challenge there, which we haven't been able to resolve. And then there is also the issue of um, the, the externalization. So we, we are now that within the migration circles, we are talking about EU externalization policies. Yes, it's a big problem, especially for those of us in, in ECOWAS, where at least while we are battling, we're trying to resolve our free movement problems, then there's external force there trying to try to tell us what to do. So a typical case is what happens at the border. So Ghana shares border with Burkina Faso, um, Togo, and then when there's the current insurgencies that come across, when there's a terrorist attack in Burkina Faso in Niger, migrants or displaced persons tries to, try to move across. Now, the problem is that one house is at the border. Part of that house has lights from Ghana. The toilet of that house is in Togo or is in Burkina Faso. <laughs> and so I have my farm, I live in Ghana. My farm is in Togo. Every day I have to cross border. And so these people cross border without ID, which says you need to have an ID. But the farmer is telling you that holding an ID to my farm can create problems because this is the ID I take, I, I take to the bank. When I need money, I only take my ID when I need money and money has been brought to me. But you are asking me to hold it every day. It's not possible. Coupled with challenges of day not having. And so already, the, I, I like what Amanda, Amanda quoted from the Kenyan government. So we have problems with the way our borders have been situated for us. And now we have external policy saying that before you move, you need to have an ID. And these people are stranded from their home countries, moving across. And so I'm doing the study and I'm asking them, are these people moving here a security threat? They say, no, they are not a security threat at all. They are families. And then they will tell you, I'm just going for a wedding and you're asking me to show ID. For what? It's wedding of my uncle, you know? So there are those complexities. And when you go to Senegal, it's the same. Senegal, before you cross to one region to the other, you need to show an ID. I mean, how is that possible? That I'm going to another region of the same country. I need an ID. These, these are not things that we are familiar with. And so it's already creating challenges for us. And I'm sure Amanda would talk about that. And then how do we have counter narratives about the donor monies? Yes. <laughs> I know that yesterday I was discussing with Oliver. So I know that he's, he's also keen on listening to that. Well, so we need some way of, we need a magic to create the funds from internal, um, internal sources. We don't have a lot of internal avenues. Yes, you can have little consultancies here and there to at least help you do or research money to do things. But if you want to really tell the story, you need to have big funds. But again, our governments need to see the importance of doing research. If they see the importance of doing research, then they can come to us and invest in it. Recently, there is a debate on even taking the, so University of Ghana, they give us book and research allowance every year. The politicians said they want to take the money away and don't want to even, and that's up just $1,000 for the whole year. So they don't see the relevance of doing research. So they always tell us your research is in shelves. It's not in shelves. We are making impact, but they don't want to use it. And so we need to start creating more political will from the government side where we'll be able to create more funds and be able to do it. But again, there's a proverb in the local language that says that the fact that I'm poor or I don't have money doesn't mean I don't have a voice. At least I can tell you that though I'm poor, I don't like this food. So yes, while we try to create avenues for ourselves, maybe we can also have a voice to say, this thing you are giving me, it doesn't help me. So let me find a way out. And so we will look for the funds and we are working on that. But I think some donors are also giving us, for instance, IGRC, you can apply and use the money for what you want. So there's some leeway compared to EU, compared to other funding sources where you need 
and a northern partner to be able to apply. At least we, we are getting there. And I hope we'll, there will be a big launch of donor from our continent from African Union one day. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, in terms of the uh, border controls, I think a lot has already been said on that. Um, one other thing we're seeing is uh, joint border controls between um, national um, national immigration or national police authorities and uh, and and Frontex. Uh, also, trainings uh, in the region implemented by Frontex, which has led to more controls in the region, which I argue along with several other authors that it undermines the whole uh, process of free movement in the region. We've also seen a re uh, an increase in corruption because of the of the increase in the in the number of of uh, checkpoints. So in my other life, I used to work as a as a trade uh, trade uh, policy expert and my work in West Africa was to look at implementing national policies linked to reducing the number of border checkpoints or uh, um, checkpoints, custom checkpoints along uh, uh, specific uh, uh, trade routes in, in the region uh, because you wanted to reduce the time that it took for products, especially fresh, fresh products to go from uh, the farm to the market. Uh, and we succeeded in reducing the number of, of, uh, of, of uh, checkpoints along certain routes. And then the EU started with its, uh, with its focus on uh, reducing irregular migration. And then we saw uh, a lot of these uh, border checkpoints pop up again, this time not as customs uh, checkpoints, but as immigration um, checkpoints, which have the same effect of uh, reducing, uh, of increasing the time uh, a truck will spend from the farm to the market and have the same effect of reducing uh, the, the lifetime of that uh, produce. So not only the Im impact on uh, migrants moving within the region, but also the impact on trade within the region was was uh, was a, a little bit uh, uh, frustrating to see. Okay, in terms of uh, free movement, Mary, I agree with you to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have uh, uh, three, uh, it's, it's phased into, into, into three uh, 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 rights, uh, the right of, of, of entry, the right of uh, residence, and uh, the right of establishment. Uh, I like to argue that the right of, of entry is is already fixed, uh, depending on how you move anyway. And in, 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 in the region, if you move using the airports, you have a more freer, um, uh, you have a more freer um, entry than if you move across the borders where sometimes you're asked uh, to baptize your passport, quote and unquote, um, uh, and then you face some challenges uh, with with moving across across borders um, in the region. But when it comes to the right of residence, uh, the uh, ECOWAS uh, uh, heads of states have already removed. Pre previously, there used to be a 90-day um, right, so you could enter any ECOWAS member state and stay there for 90 days. Uh, the ECOWAS uh, uh, heads of states in 2016, I think, removed the limitation of 90 days. So it means that you can stay for as long as possible, uh, but the immigration officers will still give you a stamp uh, for 90 days or 60 days. So it, the policy has hasn't really translated down into practice. In terms of uh, free labor mobility, I argue that there is free labor mobility because you can enter into these countries and subject to national law. So you need to register at the, at the immigration service to obtain a work permit, and then you're able to work in these countries. Um, however, uh, like Mary mentioned, the bulk of the migration still occurs within the informal sector, but for skilled migrants who move within the region, uh, there is a possibility for them to register, obtain a national work permit, and then they're able to um, they're able to work within these countries. On the issue of um, skills recognition, yes, within English-speaking West Africa, it is a huge problem. But within French-speaking West Africa, they solved this problem a long time ago. So I guess the the challenge now is translating what has worked.
worked in French speaking West Africa to the rest of the English uh, uh, speaking neighbors to see how uh, uh, we can work around um, skills, uh, skills uh, recognition. Also student mobility is a huge part of that movement. And, and uh, again, it's subject to, to national recognition. Uh, sorry, to national regulations. Um, how can the uh, power of donors be mitigated, especially when it comes to these issues of uh, countering um, some of these narratives? I, uh, I, I argue in, in, in most of the work that I've done that uh, we need stronger regional voices. So as one country, you cannot go alone. You need stronger regional voices, which is where the regional economic communities and a uh, continental body like the AU come in. And so I argue that the AU and the regional economic communities need to take a stronger position in opposing uh, some of these narratives or in opposing some of these activities that are being pushed um, by, by the EU. But what we see again is, is some form of agency by the local actors. So yes, the EU comes that XYZ, uh, XYZ measures have to be implemented at a certain border. Uh, and these actors want to Perhaps they, they've decided, okay, at this border, we need to digitize all our processes, but the EU wants us to implement these border restrictive measures. Well, if we implement the border restrictive measures to a certain extent, we will get the digitization that we want. So let's cooperate with them get the digitization we want. And then at some point we throw away these policies and we don't do any border restrictive measures. So there is some sort of using uh, these donor funds to satisfy domestic needs that have been there for a long time and cannot be uh, uh, met by uh, local uh, funding, funding uh, local available uh, uh, funding that is available. Uh, they, they are using these donor funds to meet that. And at the point where these needs are met, then you, you throw off the, the, the donor priorities and, and you decide, well, it's it's no longer your priority and you don't want to, which is where you get the, the EU now having discussions around lack of cooperation um, between uh, partner countries and, and EU member states. Um, just to add, to build on the last point, first, I think billions and millions of euros spent on this border management or on these uh, equipments need to be assessed in the first place. Does it really deter irregular migration in the Sahel or in the uh, Trans-Mediterranean or in the Horn of Africa region? Need to be assessed. And also, uh, this regional looks like IGAD, for example, the Inter-Authority uh, Development uh, agency in the whole east of eastern part of Africa, they are just uh, reinforcing the existing narratives. If you look at whatever migration project and programs they are doing, they are doing on border management, on irregular migration, or combating trafficking and so on. Uh, for them, I think getting that million into their budget is a plus by itself. So we need to address broader issues like corruption or inequality, globalization, climate change, all these things. Uh, donors need to uh, think about the interventions, whether they are effective given the amount of money spent. It is not uncommon for European Union and member states to invite African authorities to go to Brussels and other parts of Europe to identify undocumented migrants, it's many, a lot of, and they identify a few only undocumented migrants. That is to satisfy um, constituencies. And we need to respond to the labor market instead of political opinions or whatever. And uh, uh, regional universities and national universities or also like um, continental ones, African Union, they do have this framework, national uh, continent-wide regional policy frameworks and so on. And wh who is writing those policy frameworks? I know the, in East Africa, so many African countries, Kenya, Uganda, Somalia, and South Sudan, they have developed national migration policy. IOM hired international consultant and then that is drafted, tick the box. So those national migration policies are they really uh, in line with other development priorities in that country. 
or in that region. And I think we are missing the structural root causes like inequality or corruption or climate change or conflict. Some, some regional bodies like IGAD would be very instrumental in building peace in the region instead of combating human trafficking or so on. So we need to prioritize and also uh, give some localization uh, at the center, local actors instead of international actors. And the whole migration project sometimes thinking critically, it is giving job opportunities for destination country citizens. Some people argue that way as well. So um, it's very complex and migration and even I, wouldn't say I'm a migration expert or a migration scholar because that is a very interdisciplinary subject and it needs to uh, collaborate with different sectors and actors at different levels in order to address migration. It's not a narrow subject, it's related with economy, social, political, environmental, all these things. So uh, donors need to prioritize, need to be focused and and assess whether their interventions are effective vis-a-vis -vis with the amount of money spent in that particular interventions. Thank you. Um, we have now come to the end of the Q&A session. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers again for um, putting so much effort in answering many questions that were posed to them.